Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. This is Laurie Smith on Blog Talk Radio, and it is Friday, uh, March 5th, and 5.30 in the morning here in Calgary, Alberta. And, uh, yeah, I'm just so happy to be here. This is One Child Abuse Survivor to Another, and we're on for 15 minutes this morning, just continuing on with our topic um, that we were just kind of working through this week and a little bit last week. And, uh, actually, yes, it was uh, the last couple of weeks. Um, Understanding Child Maltreatment and Juvenile Delinquency, Foundations for Effective Responses. And I found this article at www.cwla. Dot org and it's written by Janet Wig W I I G J D M S W and uh, the first uh, this is part two understanding child maltreatment and juvenile delinquency foundations for effective responses we went through the part one uh, last week and that was um, understanding child maltreatment and juvenile delinquency the research and that was by Kathy Spatz Whittem and so we yeah, have just some interesting information and, and I'm happy that you can be here um, yeah this is not a professional show I don't hold any professional certificates in counseling or therapist or you know certificates or anything like that um, you know I can't offer any legal advice I'm just a person who just pays to do this blog talk radio show just to bring information to people that I find um, you know, I, I plan on continuing my studies in international community development, child rights, human rights, uh, you know, and just really, um, especially just to, to promote awareness, education, and prevention of child abuse, and uh, really all human rights abuses. So that's why I do this show, and it really, you know, I'm studying, and as I'm working through this uh, and, and looking at the information, I just, uh, I just like to bring it out to everybody, and I just think uh, abuse is such a serious issue in our world, not just in North America, but all around the world, and I think that um, there's not enough people talking about it, and there's just not, it's always been kind of shoved under the carpet, because it's such a painful topic, nobody wants to discuss it, but the fact is, is you know, kids are dying, and uh, kids are dying at the hands of their caregivers and their parents and uh, other uh, sexual predators, and they're, if they don't die, they're in the hospital from abuse-related injuries and, and having to be removed from the homes. And um, I, We just need to really work on ways to actually prevent this from happening. And how are we going to do that? You know, there's uh, there's some good programs in 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 use, you know, right now, and but they're just not everywhere. You know, there's certain programs in certain cities, in certain in certain uh, counties, in certain schools, but it's just not, uh, you know, a nationwide type of thing. So that's the issue. It's so huge. We really need to find what's working and then kind of build from that. And I was just looking at uh, these articles just for some information regarding the link between uh, juvenile delinquency and child abuse because it's, I, you know, I, I know that there's a direct link just in, from my own family and lots of people that I knew growing up. Grow, growing up. So you know, I, I just wanted to see what the actual link was and if there was any information out there regarding it. There isn't a whole lot of information on it. I've uh, been looking around on the web, and um, that's how I found these articles, and just looking for the link between child abuse and juvenile delinquency. And there's not a whole lot written about it. Um, this was just some stuff that I kind of, you know, I was really happy to run into. And they did say that, you know, there's a, at the time these were written, which was probably in the 90s, that this... Uh, so this information is quite old, and the statistics obviously have changed. But at this time, uh, in the 90s, when it was written, the, the, uh, there was a 21% uh, higher risk for children who have been abused or maltreated to go on and commit a serious uh, violent crime as uh, adults and even as youth. So it's just so important that we address this situation. And we're going to take a look at... Um, the next part of the article, and this is uh, part two, is kind of, it's more of a long article with lots of, um, you know, more, more almost clinical stuff in it, but I'm just going to finish it up today. Discussion of programmatic responses, and you can kind of continue on. You can check these out at yourself um, at www.cwla.org, and they are really worth looking at and worth reading. I think there's lots of good information there about the fact that they have implemented lots of programs, and they've seen success rates when the programs are in place as compared to the you know the other control groups that are not receiving this same kind of uh, help and you know with the family and and in in the school and with the peers and just the whole um you know the support system for the parents and the support system for these children and these youths you know who who have been abused and 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 when they find that when they go into the home and they actually work with the parents they work with the children uh there's so they the the percentage of the, the 
actually don't go on to commit uh, violent crimes is actually awesome. So it is working, and uh, I wish it was everywhere. I, I really do, because kids need help, and uh, kids don't want to... Um, you know, they don't. I, I can't imagine a child actually wanting to go out and just on purpose ruin their life by committing a, crime, a violent crime or ruining someone else's life. Um, you have to wonder what kind of a home that these children are are coming from, what kind of a home these people uh, grew up in. You know what I mean? And um, I think about that stuff because I know just growing up in my own home, um, you know, what was going on in there could cause anybody to go out and do a violent crime. And so um, <clears throat> I just know it happens, and I know that there's. So many people out there dealing with it. So I'm going to read right from the page. Just listen at your own discretion, please. If it's something that is going to bother you, then you know, or t a, a subject that is just so sensitive for you, you know, I, I, you wouldn't be hurting my feelings by turning it off. And you have to know what's good for you to listen to. And if you're a young person, you know, and a, a, you, especially a really young person, child, make sure that you get someone to listen to this with, with you, because you know they can help you with questions and help you find more information on it. You know, abuse is a really sensitive topic. And I just want everybody to be in a safe place. So you have to listen at your own discretion and just make sure that you're okay to be listening to this. And, um, and yeah, so I'm glad you can join me. Discussion of programmatic responses. A review of preceding prevention and intervention programs, although only a sampling of existing programs, illustrates that there is much that should assist the child welfare, juvenile justice, and related systems to develop a strong continuum of programming in each community to prevent delinquency. It has been pointed out that many of the risk factors for child abuse and neglect are the same as the risk factors for future delinquency and that factors exist in common between the early onset and older juvenile offenders. Effective programming targets risk factors in multiple domains and includes, whenever possible, a focus on both the child and the family. Elements of effective programming can be summarized as programs that address the entire context of child and family functioning, provide support for parents, provide parent education, focus on improved parent-child interaction, include good individualized assessment of the child, identify risk factors and needs, uh, target risk factors at the child, family, neighborhood, and peer level, and involve a multi-model approach, draw on community support, and integrate the services of schools and the juvenile justice and child welfare and mental health systems. Emphasize behavior skills development for both parent and child and direct activities to long-term outcomes for children. Uh, for example, reduction in, in exposure to abuse, neglect, and violence in the home, reduction in delinquent behavior, and school success, school competency. The need for good individualized assessment of the child cannot be overemphasized. A program with proven effectiveness still needs to be a good match for the particular child tailored to address the child's needs. The focus on, an, on, on early onset offenders using risk factors to determine the level of intervention and placing high-risk offenders in a long-term intervention has received national attention due to its promise as a delinquency prevention strategy. This strategy raises important considerations. Leber and Farrington note that there is a need for additional screening methods to identify very young offenders who are at risk of becoming serious uh, and violent juvenile offenders. They state that although a few screening methods are available, based on known risk factors, more needs to be done to evaluate their predictive utility. It is also important to remember that it is the accumulation of multiple risk factors across multi multiple domains that places children at high risk of delinquency, not the presence of one or two factors in one or two categories. As to targeting children for long-term intervention, it is important to reserve this for the very high-risk offenders, to be conscious of unnecessary, lab uh, unnecessary labeling, and to deliver a program that presents uh, children with a uh, panoply of, of positive experiences in school, sports, arts, and other extracurricular activities with the opportunity to help others uh, with positive role models and with skill building activities rather than just a focus on their delinquent behavior. And I know I, I sure wish a fa uh, that someone would have stepped in with our family because, um, you know, none of us were, none of us got any help at all. We were just kind of going through uh, on our own dealing with everything. Our parents uh, they were told to get help, and they, they, they only went to like two counseling sessions, and um, then we moved, and we kind of lost, we got out of the system, you know. And it's unfortunate because uh, my brothers, uh, I really attribute that to, to my, the death of my brothers, 
uh, because, you know, one went on to kill himself at the age of 33, uh, suicide. For, uh, he was a cocaine addict. The other one went on to uh, continue using uh, prescription meds and, uh, you know, illegal drugs as well and uh, died of a drug overdose in a shelter in Calgary at the age of 43. And another brother of mine was killed and, you know, whether it was murder or, or you know, accident or whatever, they never really knew the whole truth on it. And so um, at the age of 19, and, um, you know, me, I could have gotten into some serious trouble. Um, you know, I was just very, uh, I didn't want to get in trouble at home. So that's why I stayed very low on the radar screen as far as uh, getting caught. And so, um, you know, uh, that's just the whole thing. We just went right under the radar screen. And I sure wish that uh, there would have been an intervention done and, you know, that we would have either been removed from the home or there would have been some people that stepped in and made uh, daily visits, <laughs> you know what I mean? They'd have to be a daily visit um, just to make sure that everything is going the way that it should be going because our family needed some serious help. And I know that this is going on right now. People are falling under the, the radar screen, and that's why kids are dying. Otherwise, if it was a perfect system and there was no such thing as child abuse, we wouldn't be seeing the reports in the paper. You know, we wouldn't be seeing, um, you know, all this terrible tragedies, you know, children dying and at the hands of their parents and caregivers and, uh, you know, or just, be, you know, being abused so badly that they suffer these injuries and they end up in the hospital. And, you know, the lifetime effects, you know, the long-term effects of child abuse is just horrific. And uh, because these kids, if they survive the abuse, are going to go on to uh, either, you know, completely ruin their own lives and everybody else's they can take down with them, uh, or they'll go the other way and they'll struggle along, um, like myself, and struggle, 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 and maybe not get help when they should. And so that's why I highly recommend, you know, everybody just make sure you do uh, reach out and get some help if you really, uh, you know, if you've grown up in an abusive home, make sure that you do get some support no matter what it is, a good friend, uh, a good group to get into, you know, a child abuse survivor group, uh, or, you know, like to check check around, see if the ASCA is in your area, the adult survivors of child abuse groups, just things like that, you know, just to make sure we get the help that we need, because, you know, obviously we didn't get it when we were a child, so we need to look after ourselves, right? We need to learn how to do that. So important. And um, so, yeah, the, the, the article is quite long, and it goes, it just keeps kind of going into the same thing, but it says, the message should be clear that the earlier the intervention, the better. A message that has important implications for the operation of the child welfare and juvenile justice systems to reduce the future risk of delinquency. The child welfare system needs to address broader dimensions than protection, removal, and reunification. Uh, it should focus some attention on long-term outcomes for the health and well-being of children. So it just kind of keeps going on, and um, I don't think we're going to cover any more of it. But I sure I think that you should, uh, you know, if you're interested in this stuff. It's really a, worth reading. It does go into just a lot of what's going on in each state, you know, California, Connecticut, Arizona. It just goes on uh, all the way through there, Oregon and different things and cost-benefit work and things like that, Washington State, and um, they start looking at numbers and whatnot, right? But you can um, you can definitely go and check that out, www.cwla.org, and I, I highly recommend it. Uh, next week, we're going to, it's Monday morning, we're going to look at understanding crisis and especially to do with family crisis. Our family was always at a crisis and we, we never did ever get out of a crisis. So I think it's a great thing to look at uh, as far as uh, crisis intervention and uh, just a lot on uh, what happens and what goes through a person's mind and a child's mind in a crisis situation in the home where there's a lot of abuse that, uh, or even just neglect, right? So, uh, which is which is abuse. So, thank you so much for tuning in. You know, we got about a minute left, and um, um, I'll be back on tonight, 9:30, and uh, that's uh, we're going to be ch talking about uh, the Survivor to Thriver workbook. We're going to keep going through that, and that's at 9:30 Mountain Mountain Standard Time, and that's Child Abuse Prevention and Human Rights Abuse Prevention is up to us, and that we're going to continue on with that tonight. And uh, I'm the Canada Regional Director for Dreamcatchers for Abused Children. And I recommend their website to everybody. Uh, and I recommend that everyone uh, get the signs and symptoms and understand how to report child abuse. You never know when a child's going to come to you and say, I've been abused. Uh, you need to know the proper way to report it. We all do. I do. You do. Uh, because you can mess up a case for a child if you don't know how to report it properly. And, um, you know, you just definitely want to get, and it's so easy. There's just a few steps, you know. It's, it's, it's who, when, where, what, you know what I mean? It's as simple as that. And just recording the child's own words, not adding words to it, and making sure that you do make the call, make the phone call. You can save a child's life. That's www.dreamcatchers.com. 
for abusechildren.com. And uh, you can join us on Tuesday nights. That's um, Dreamcatchers Talk Radio here on Blog Talk Radio. And that is uh, best-selling author and president, Donna Shear, and myself co-hosting. And... Um, you know, we're going to be talking about some awesome, awesome, uh, interesting, and very informative topics coming up. Uh, what is uh, neglect? And uh, we're going to have guests on eventually. This is a new show. We've only done four. And so uh, Tuesday night at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I hope you will join us live for Dreamcatchers Talk Radio. So thank you so much for joining me this morning and I really appreciate your support and everything. And have a great day, everybody. Have a great weekend. Take care. Bye-bye.